Yeah, it'll be more about Gibson than Gestalt, but I worked them in. I have to say, uh, in terms of the title of the conference, The World in Us, that I'm in the minority who, who thinks that there are representations and that one of the functions of the visual system is to get the world in us not phenomenally located in us, but in a way in which our perceptual experience, which is in us, can be of the world. So I'm going to try to convince you in the first part of the paper through some phenomenological investigations um, that there has to be a subjectively conditioned aspect to visual experience, even of space. Um, and so then in the second half of the talk, I'm going to try to convince you that when you try to figure out how resonance might work uh, and, and sort of build a mechanism for responding to Gibsonian higher order stimulus variables, that it's also natural to think in terms of representations. I must say that these representations won't be symbols for sure and they won't be sense data. And I'll comment a little bit on the rhetorical moves that are made where representations are made to be only symbols or sense data and symbols or sense data are bad so there must, must not be representations, which I think is way, way too easy. All right, arguments about the role of rep oh, no, I should say there's a handout and that the handout has nothing on it that won't be up here or won't be read out by me. The function of the handout is for you to have the long quotations and the, and the complicated analyses later on when they're not on the screen or not being read out in case you want to refer to them uh, for th in thinking about a question or whatever. Okay. Let's see what time it is. Okay, it's actually we're starting in about a quarter of. Arguments about the role of representation in perception and cognition are sometimes beset by oversimplification into binary choices. Representation, anti-representation, symbol versus connectionism, symbols versus dynamic systems, direct theory versus constructivism. These dichotomies may be paired up. So we can have symbolic representation versus anti-representational versions of connectionism or dynamicism. Then the argument goes, symbolic representations and syntactically based computations are not good for explaining, say, perception, so we should reject computation and representations and embrace, according to Gibson and some of his friends, direct realism and resonance models of information pickup, resonance being a type of dynamic model. I think the landscape of arguments and positions is not so simple. I want to map out a portion of this landscape as I see it. My themes are representation and construction as related to Gibson with an eye towards his Gestalt predecessors. I will contend that on some understandings of representation and construction, Gibson's arguments against them are not compelling. I will stick to perception and leave cognition aside for now, by which I mean that I'll focus on the visual perception of the, of the layout, of the surface layout with some qualities without going much into affordances or object recognition. Gibson himself was deeply interested in how things look, including surface layouts, and there's chapters after chapters, even in the 79 book about just the surface layout, and that is the aspect of perception that I will consider. Now, of course, I don't equate visual perception with conscious visual experience or with conscious visual experience of surfaces and qualities. I only require that conscious visual experience often reveals the objects of perception, including surface layout and qualities, whether directly, as Gibson thinks, or via mediating phenomenal experience, as the Gestaltists thought and as I think. Accordingly, I'll offer evidence and theoretical considerations to suggest that visual experience uh, typically, typically does not, um, this is a thing about oversimplification that I got from Tony, uh, that visual experience um, According to all, offer evidence and theoretical considerations to suggest that visual experience typically does not directly conform to mind-independent physical properties of the layout, and I'll sort of be accusing of Gibson of a latent physicalism, but presents the environment phenomenally, 
in a way that reveals organism relative stable features of it. This sounds like an ecological approach, and so it is intended to be. And I'll suggest that Gibson and clear thinking Gibsonians could accept that subject relative phenomenal experience presents and so represents the environment while avoiding the truly bad aspects of mediational accounts, sense data, and hyper intellectualization of the perceptual process. The role of these representations is understood through a task analysis or teleofunctional parsing of the visual system as a system for, among other things, representing a surface layout and its properties. I'll also describe a way of thinking about organismic processes that operate to produce the environmentally directed perceptual experience. Gibson describes that these processes, not his preferred word, um, he describes these processes at two levels. At a higher level of perceptual systems that detect, his word, physical properties of the environment, and as a project for physiologists at the level of patterns of receptor activations that must be integrated by the visual system. He wants the latter, this physiological explanation of resonance or detection, um, to be cast in physiological dynamic terms, but there may be grounds for introducing a functional division of labor that includes a role for represented information about the optic array or about stimulus patterns. On the view described here, granting a role for represented information does not require invoking cognitive notions such as inference and interpretation. All right, so the first part about, is about two questions about representation and perception. As regards perception, questions about representation arise in at least two contexts. First, in perceptual experience of the environment at the personal level or the whole organism level, appro appropriately described as, I should, that's a question, is perceptual experience of the environment at the personal level or the whole organism level appropriately described as representing that environment? Let us call this the problem of phenomenal experience of the environment. We will consider two answers already mentioned, Gibson's direct theory and the Gestalt notion of phenomenal mediation. Second, are the processes or detector activities that mediate environmental contact plausibly said to instantiate representational content, that is, represented information states that interact within subsystems and between subsystems, ultimately to yield this personal level perceptual experience? Let us call this the problem of information integration to produce perception. Gibson was against invoking representation in relation to either problem, advancing instead his direct realism. He wanted to avoid organism-level representations because he thought of them as sense data interposed between perception and environment. He believed that to speak of representations here is to commit oneself to the idea that we see the representations directly and only become informed of the environment indirectly by inferring from the uh, immediately perceived representations. Taking this conception of mediation as emblematic, he then countered that perception is direct, we perceive the environment without mediation. I offer instead a description of visual experience that mediates perception without that experience itself being the immediate object of perception and without a need for the environment to be inferred. Gibson was also against representation instantiating subprocesses because he thought that they were posited so as to add additional information to the stimulus array and that they involved complex cognitive operations such as inference and interpretation. The second aspect of his saying that perception is direct is to say that it is cognitively unmediated. There are no cognitive processes involved in producing perception, which means that no inferences, whether innate or learned, are required for perception to occur. I will suggest that a decomposition of the detector mechanism needed to pick up the information offers a role for represented information that is not hyperintellectualized and doesn't invoke um, symbolic computation. So the next section is organism level experience of an environment. Gibson considered the accepted theory of visual perception, which I will call a constructivist analysis, to consist of these key points, and they're up here and they're on the handout. 
1C. The stimulus for vision, including that for spatial configuration of a scene, is impoverished and hence ambiguous, failing to specify the third dimension. Two, this impoverished stimulus produces sensations that mirror the proximal stimulus, the retinal image. In the case of vision, three, in order to make up for this impoverished and uh, impoverishment and produce perceptions that correspond or come close to the physical scene, computations or infer inferences based on memory or past experience are required. Four, the product of sensation and inferences is a constructed sense datum, a mental item that serves as the object of perception. And five, the proximal sensations and inferential processes are unconscious or unnoticed, and that's why we don't easily discover them by phenomenal refraction. To replace this picture, Gibson held that, number one, the stimulus for vision is rich and it carries information that specifies unequivocally the spatial layout. Two, rich stimulation produces a direct perception of the spatial layout with its objective properties. Three, no computation or inferences are needed. Instead, a rich stimulus information is picked up and responded to by perceptual systems. And four, we do not, in normal vertical perception, perceive sense data or have mediating experiences, but we are directly aware of the physical scene itself. And five, there is no need for unconscious psychological operations, rather there are unconscious physiological processes that integrate receptor input. And my description of Gibson's position as involving the physical scene and so forth is purposeful and, and I'll make actually heavy weather of that. An additional contrast between constructivism and Gibson concerned experimental methods. In order to reveal the existence of proximally oriented sensations, experiments were constructed using impoverished conditions. Under such conditions, size and shape constancy break down so as to reveal, according to constructivism, the true elements of perception. According to Gibson, the impoverished stimulus conditions produce abnormal sensations that tend toward the proximal stimulus. Under normal rich stimulus conditions, which include both use of both eyes and the mobility of the perceiver, the information received by the perceptual system allows the perceiver to be directly aware of the spatial layout and, the, and other properties of things. So Gibson often wrote as if these were the only two uh, choices, either constructivism or him. If you speak of things looking small in the distance or of a penny looking elliptical when seen at a slant, you are forcing proximal stimulations into experience, according to Gibson, either through impoverished viewing conditions or by adopting a special attitude. Gibson acknowledged that if perception did not regularly conform to the, quote, objective facts of the environment, that would be a problem for his theory. Problematic examples for him included cases in which, under full cue or full information conditions, there is incomplete perceptual constancy. And this is uh, something that he discussed both in 66 and in 79. As when a coin is said to look elliptical or railway tracks are, are said to converge phenomenally. In these full cue cases or full information cases, he suggested that either the described result, so a lot of people do think that the tracks seem to converge, he says either it's poor phenomenology or that the effect of an attitude is coming in to create the sensations that intrude upon experience. So you're taking the painter's attitude, say, in the case of the, uh, the railway tracks. He countered the poor phenomenology by saying that the penny looks like a circle at a slant, so that unless viewed at an extreme angle, um, it looks like a circle. And I find this response compelling. So I think that the circular thing seen at a slant, I, there is a sense in which I understand why people call them elliptical. It has to do with some kind of response to visual angles. But to me, it's, it's always a circle at a slant, and it looks like a circle. He responded to the claim that things look small in the distance by saying that they don't. He cited an experiment with stakes in an open landscape in which average responses of full constancy were achieved even at a distance of nearly a half mile. If we take this to suggest that, under ordinary perceptual conditions, there is no phenomenal diminution at distances of a quarter mile, or of 100 feet, or of 20 feet, then I'm just incredulous. I just can't believe it. Um, I am not saying that to an adult perceiver, things look as if they were diminished in physical size in the distance, but I do assert that this is a persistent, uh, prevalent, 
common majority experience of everyone that if you look down the railroad tracks, if you look down the uh, road, uh, you don't need to take a special attitude. It looks like it converges. And if we can't agree on this phenomenology, then um, I'm in big trouble, or else you're not very sensitive in your phenomenological descriptions. So let us return to the phenomenological point in a bit. Gibson also knew and occasionally mentioned a, a tradition that was distinct from standard constructivism, that of the Gestalt psychologists. Kafka was Gibson's colleague at Smith, and Gibson attended Kafka's weekly seminar with some regularity from 1928 to 1941. Kafka's Principles, which was praised by Gibson as, quote, one of the great books of the century, laid out a theory of perception that accepted 1C in the constructivist analysis, uh, the impoverishment of the stimulus with respect to perceptual experience, but rejected 2C uh, to 5C. So here's the uh, Kafka analysis. Now the Gestaltists were no friend to, to proximal stimulation or unconscious mental operations. The impoverished stimulus can yield a representation of a spatial chromatic world, because they did accept the impoverished stimulus, through brain processes that operate dynamically to produce organized perceptions and tend in the direction of the constancies of shy, si, uh, size, shape, and color, for instance. Organization includes figure ground relations, enhanced contrasted edges, grouping by proximity or similarity, and so on. And we've seen several examples of these Gestalt principles of organization, several demonstrations. Perceptions in the, direct, uh, in the direction of shape constancy result from field forces in the physiological medium that drive, for instance, a slim ellipse toward more regularity or roundness under the constraint of the shape slant invariance hypothesis, which I'll explain in a minute. Size is somewhat different. Kampka accepts Curler's suggestion that distance is undervalued, so that things um, don't appear to be as far away as, as they are. That would get you the train tracks converging, for instance. That objects are, quote, brought nearer in Kafka's rendition of what Curler told him, and that they are made smaller for dynamic reasons in accordance with the size-distance invariance hypothesis, and also the size-distance invariance hypothesis I'll explain in a minute. So the Gestalt psychologists accepted a distinction between physical objects and the perceptual experience of those objects. The physical objects are not directly presented to consciousness as in the acquaintance relation of naive direct realism, but our perceptual experience, quote, mediates contact with the physical environment. Perceptual experience is not composed of sensations or constructed from inferences according to them, it is the product of dynamic brain processes that operate holistically to yield an or organized percept. Kafka called the world of immediate experience the behavioral environment, and we were introduced to this term a couple days ago, I think, which is opposed to the geographic or physical environment. The horseman on Lake Constance rides over solid ground in his behavioral environment, but over the thin ice of the lake in his geographical environment. Kafka notes a similarity between his notion of behavioral environment and Curler's direct experience, which, by the way, does not mean direct realism, but rather phenomenologically described experience as we have it in the case of Curler's term, direct experience. But Kafka prefers his behavioral environment over Curler's direct experience because, quote, it, behavioral environment, signifies the exact place which it has in the system, that is, the mediation between geographical environment um, and behavior. So here we have this figure, which is a little tiny figure down in the corner of the page in Kafka's 1935 book, Principles of Gestalt Psychology, which gives us the relations among all these things. And my laser pointer doesn't show up on the screen, so um, you can see here G, which is over here on the left, that's the geographical environment, that's the physical environment. Um, it affects the organism and sets up in the organism dynamic processes that present, that develop it into a phenomenal behavioral environment, which is not phenomenologically located inside the body, but, is but includes the body and things located outside the body. Um, the ego is there with PHB, phenomenal behavior, 
So um, it posits an ego that's sort of aware of the, of, the, of the behavioral environment and also aware of phenomenal behavior, of intentions to move and things, and of movings of the arms, which occurs in the behavioral environment. But those things are actually also done by RB, the real body, which is part of the real organism, RO, which causally affects the geographic environment and then can feed back into the behavioral environment. So this is Kafka's uh, little diagram of how the behavioral environment and the geographical um, environment um, are related. Now one might take the behavioral environment to be a kind of sense datum, uh, but so that it would be literally have the properties it appears to have and it might be seem to be two-dimensional and, and so forth. Um, but I don't read Kafka that way. Rather, I take it that the behavioral environment is a presentation to the ego of, of the geographic environment under an aspect. It presents the world in a subjectively conditioned way. Further, the Gestaltists did not believe that in order to be correct, the perceptual representations, the behavioral environment, had to present only the objective, mind-independent physical structures. Rather, the behavioral environment presents the geographical environment as having figure ground organization, enhanced edges, groupings, and the like. But they did not consider these departures from a neutral physical description of the geographic environment to be illusions or mistakes. I'm slightly less clear about the departures from constancy that Kafka describes, exemplified by thing, things looking smaller in the distance or pennies looking elliptical. But my sense is that Kafka would agree that standards of correctness for size perception need not majorize measured physical metric size. For instance, the comparative phenomenal nearness of distant things, according to Kafka and Curler's account that he um, and sort of presents, as it were, by correspondence, um, those things might be functionally good because sort of bringing the far things closer phenomenally supports their perceptual surveyability, clarity, and articulation. And I th actually, I think this point's partly right, but there's no, um, no time to explain that here. I believe that Gibson did think that these departures from physics are mistakes. And I want to say now that I think Gibson's development of the ecological perspective was a major contribution to vision science, uh, but I'm going to be a bit critical of it because I think it has a latent physicalism in it. So this doesn't mean to reject the whole uh, ecological approach, but it means to um, uh, critique a certain part of how Gibson, uh, in the end, understood this ecological approach. So I think his ecological psychology took into account ecological facts such as the scale of, of the environment in relation to the physical organism, the placement of the physical organism in relation to the physical scene, standing features of illumination and surfaces, and the relation of the animal or the type of animal to media such as air, land, and water, and so on and so forth, all of this wonderfully rich a description of the environment and always in relation to the physical uh, organism. He believed that these factors had a subjective element, and that's his word, by which he did not mean mind-dependent, but rather that they take into account the physical relation of the subject to the scene, the physical size of the subject in relation to the physical sizes of things, and so forth. So they're subjective in the sense that the perceiving organism, the subject, has a certain physical size, and that is, is relevant in thinking about its relation to the environment and at what scale you should be giving, considering the environment for that subject. But it can all be defined in terms of physical relations. There's nothing sort of mentalistic subjective about it. And he retained the uh, notion of objective as being determined by physical properties. And this is both in the 66 and the 69 book. Thus, he did not escape, on my view, as he might have, the naive realist preference for objective physical description as the content that perception seeks to reveal. And he keeps repeating the results from that 1950 experiment and saying, see, we get the sizes, the physical sizes right, 
way out there to half a mile. And that's what perception is after, getting the physical scene as it is. All right, let us return to size perception and the phenomenology of things looking small in the distance. Gibson believed that this phenomenology is artificially produced, this idea of things looking small in the distance, by taking a uh, perspective attitude. And he illustrated that uh, with this diagram from the 1979 book. And so you've got the perceiver over there um, on the right, um, and you've got the actual physical thing as a, tr as a rectangle on the ground there. And then there are these ghost shapes that you could experience if you were taking a painter's attitude, but you didn't get it exactly into the painter's plane. Maybe you only got it partway there or so forth, or else fully, and then you'd have a trapezoid that would actually be an upright trapezoid. It'd be a, a fronto-parallel uh, trapezoid. And he calls these ghost shapes, and he thinks they're, they're intruding sensations created by the painter's attitude, and, uh, and that the normal thing is just to pursue perceive the rectangle with the physical properties it has in the physical place that it has and so forth. And there's no reason that we couldn't do that. I'm just going to argue that we don't. Uh, we don't quite regularly do that. So we got this thing with the attitudes producing those things. He held that in the normal case there's information to specify the true sizes of things and that this information is presented by invariance in the optic array, and two examples of invariance from the 79 book, but these, are, these go all the way back to the 50s book, this kind of example. Here on the left, you've got these um, little cylinders, and you can see that the, the one here in the front uh, takes up one unit, so it takes up a third of a unit and two-thirds of a unit, so it takes up uh, one unit of the, of the ground texture, the one further back also has as its width one unit of the ground texture. So from that, you could see that you would have information that that one in the back was the same objective size, or at least width, as the one in the front by its relation to the texture gradient. Right? So this is the higher order stimulus invariant that he's always kind of talking about. Same thing with the horizon line, um, which you got from uh, Sedgwick. Um, so the telephone poles are cut. Uh, in the same place in relation to the horizon all the way back. Um, so uh, that horizon line and where it cuts the telephone pole is actually related to viewer height. So you got a viewer height of some a couple, a meter and some, something. Um, and then you can actually have the physical size of all the telephone poles all the way back. So he thinks this would be a poor description of our phenomenal experience. That's a perspective drawing for a textbook. But our phenomenal experience would be with those things going into depth, which you can't do in the page and going away, but being the same size uh, all the way back. So this idea that the ratios within the optic array specify the objective layout. And, you know, he says this over and over again. So let's give him that, though I think there are additional conditions that are needed for, for the full information he gets. But um, he's using the term invariant here in a way that builds upon but changes the gestalt use. They suggested that stimulus conditions set up certain ratios that constrain possible experiences. The shape slant invariance hypothesis, according which, for a given solid angle in Gibson's terms, perceived shape varies with perceived slant. And so Gibson's also totally on board with the shape slant invariance hypothesis. Um, he just thinks that usually you get the slant right, so you get the shape right uh, in full information. Um, conditions. Similarly, perceived size varies with perceived distance. Gibson claimed that under hi that higher order ratios within the stimulus specified the objective uh, size, that is, the, the physical layout. He be believed that there are stronger constraints in the optic array than the gestaltus allowed, sufficient to allow for the relation between perceiver and object to be one of direct, unmediated awareness and acquaintance. Now, I think there are things to challenge in Gibson's claim uh, conceptually. One might wonder why the receipt at the visual system of information sufficient to specify the layout should produce a direct, uh, unmediated acquaintance with objects, as if the perceiver's uh, experience for somehow just incorporating the object uh, within it, the very physical object. Um, 
of the sort of direct acquaintance that's posited problematically by naive direct realism. And there is a strain of reference to naive direct realism, especially in uh, Gibson's 66 book. But I prefer to amount a phenomenological challenge. I believe that Gibson has used binary thinking in assimilating the phenomenology of intermediate constancy to a case of intruding sensations. Rather, I'll claim phenomenological reflection, also supported by experimental evidence, seems to suggest that intermediate results are quite normal. Let's consider the case of size constancy of things looking small in the distance. Kafka held that the size distance invariance hypothesis, and again, the, he didn't use that term, covers this case. The size distance invariance hypothesis doesn't itself specify what size something will appear to have only that the perceived size of an object varies with its perceived distance. If it were perceived at its true physical distance, then it would be perceived with its true size, as in Gibson's diagram. So I think he thinks in his diagram, the, the true physical size and distance is the rectangle on the ground, and that we just perceive it that way. It's by the size, distance, and variance hypothesis, because you've got a certain visual angle set up, and then the size that it appears to have depends upon the perceived distance within that visual angle. Perceived distance is, is accurate, then perceived size is accurate, um, as in the diagram. I, however, perceive the railway tracks as converging. Now, this is a photograph of railway tracks converging, and it's got a perspective convergence. I won't take a magic marker and draw on the television screen, uh, but if I did, uh, we would get a little dunce cap in the fronto-parallel plane, right? That would be a perspective projection of the railway tracks. When I stand on the railway tracks, carefully looking to make sure no trains are coming, um, and look down them, uh, they seem to converge to me, but they seem to converge in three dimensions. And that is not a perspective projection. You could say it's an intermediate between a perspective projection and the reality and so forth. Now, there's no reason that we couldn't perceive the railway tracks as being um, the exact size that they have, in which case they would look physically parallel, um, potentially as far away as the horizon. That would be a very, very strange phenomenology. That would mean when you go out here and you look at a building nearly on this corner of the square and the same size building on the other side of the square, there'd be no phenomenal diminution at all. And again, there's no reason that it couldn't have this. This would be full phenomenal size constancy. I claim uh, that we don't have that. So there are reasons to think that perceived distance does actually contract and fall off, and then according with the size, distance, and variance hypothesis, if perceived, perceived distance uh, falls off, um, then that rectangle it wouldn't have to be tipped up. It would just appear a bit closer and so a bit smaller within that visual angle if perceived distance were less than, than, than full distance. And these results come from Hillebrand uh, Blumenfeld, uh, Boisman in 1998, who did this with optic flow fields, found this contraction of the visual uh, space. Wagner, who's written a whole book on the geometry of the visual space. Eric Kellens in 2015, working at Utrecht, has, has found a psychophysically determinable uh, contraction of, of space with distance and so forth. And a lot of Wagner's experiments that he did were outside. Hillebrand and Blumenfeld, some of their experiments were the, were the full cues. Uh, and so forth. So in order to understand the regularity of this phenomenology and see why Kafka could accept the underperception of distance, I want you to consider this drawing from Age Sloman, a much neglected figure in the philosophy of size constancy. So he's got the perceiver P1 standing there at D with eyes at A. Uh, this perceiver is uh, standing on a ground plane, FF. Um, as the actual physical uh, ground plane um, going out there to see. Slowman's phenomenology leading to this diagram is that if we look out on the ground plane, it seems to rise a bit. So as I look out on the floor here, I claim phenomenologically that the floor seems to rise. And I invite all of you later to get up and walk around and look at the floor and see whether it appears to rise to you or not. Um, so it appears to rise. 
Well, if it arises and if visual directions are um, vertically perceived, which they are pretty much, so we could also have a variance here, a variation in visual angles and directions, but we don't seem to find that psychophysically. So if, the, if we're going within the same solid visual angle and we're going to find the size of this object O, which physically is out there at CB, but now in this visual space that's been contracted because the ground plane comes up, that pulls the distances forward out at the distance, then OF is going to be perceived at OP. And you can see the effect will be very slight up close. So OF, when it's up close, will be uh, uh, perceived at FP, but that's a tiny diminution um, of size. But the further out you go, the more diminished size you have, according to Age Slomon's construction of what follows from uh, if, in fact, we do perceive the ground as rising. So any questions just on the Age Slomon diagram so that I make sure everybody's on the same page about it? Yeah. Um, Alistair. Um, the, the idea that the direction to C is perceived accurately. So now if C is at the same phenomenal place on the floor, but the floor is up, for it to be the same phenomenal place, that, which means that also the same direction from the eye, then it has, then it has to come forward, right? It has to come forward. So this is a, an implication of the size, distance, and variance hypothesis, which I'm pretty sure both Gibson and the Gestaltus accept, yeah. Slobon reports that phenomenally floors phenomenally rise, and I agree. If they do, then we get what we just saw. There's no reason it couldn't, you couldn't not perceive the floors rise, I just think that it happens to be that we, that we do. I should mention that this diminution, although related to perspective, is not the same thing as linear perspective, and I also I already mentioned the difference between linear perspective and something going away in the distance with the train tracks. Linear perspective, the train tracks would be uh, but the train tracks aren't here, they're going away in the distance, but they're not going away straight, they're going away converged. And so that's a three-dimensional uh, contraction of visual space, not, 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 not a projection into a two-dimensional plane. So under such a kind of contraction of visual space, much information is phenomenally available. Phenomenal direction is congruent with physical direction. Objects retain an invariant proportion to their surrounds across the different distances, um, as, as we saw actually in the, in the um, in the train, in the telephone poles. So actually if a person were standing next to the poles they went back, even if the poles were contracting, the proportion of the person to the poles would be constant, uh, called relational uh, size constancy. Uh, next tuness relations on surfaces are preserved. Um, so, you know, that the, that the um, barrel is next to a certain area on the floor, uh, that's all preserved. Uh, metric order is preserved, so the, the conti continuation along the ground plane of the telephone poles, that's preserved. It's just that the, that the integrals between them phenomenally are contracted, and so on. So if these findings are right, then Gibson's phenomenology should be challenged. Size constancy is intermediate under natural conditions in the environment as ecological a setting for doing these experiments as you like. As he, and without asking anybody to take an attitude, as he realized, uh, this favors those who endorse phenomenal mediation. If the object is not itself very physical properties, but the content of visual experience is subjectively conditioned, then it's natural to locate the content um, is in the subjectively conditioned phenomenal experience of the perceiver. Uh, both the Gestaltus and Gibson agree on this, I think. They accept an age-old logic for drawing a distinction between appearance and reality, which need not, by the way, commit oneself to the appearances as sense data. Appearances can be conceived as presenting the physical world under an aspect. So contrary to Gibson's direct realism, we don't perceive the world just as it is physically. There is a tension in Gibson's thought between his assertion of full-size constancy and his ecological physics. We perceive size and shape under an aspect, 
Visual space is contracted. Color is also perceived under an aspect. Uh, Gibson uh, didn't say a lot about color, but where he does talk about it, he treats it as a surface property to be detected. Uh, but we know from color science that there is no common property among all the instances of a shade of red in the ecological environment as opposed to when you have a spectrometer or among all ecologically detectable red objects. He seems to have wanted a way out of this by suggesting that colors have ecological significance as a signal so that the redness of berries depends on the formations of sugars that signal the ripeness of the berries and that they're good to eat, uh, but not all red berries um, are good to eat. In fact, only two of these are not poisonous. Uh, the other four are poisonous. So the one in the upper left and the one in the middle bottom are not poisonous, uh, but all the other are poisonous. So if you, that's your eco signal, um, tough for you. This leads me to the following question about size. Even if Gibson is right, about information sufficient to specify physical size and distance, why should the physical value be the target of perception? What is wrong with the contracted space if it is ecologically adequate and perhaps preferable for guiding action? I mean, think about it if the things way far away were as phenomenally just as big as the things right up. Um, it would be very strange. Just as color does not re reveal the physical or chemical properties of a surface, but nonetheless aids in discrimination of surfaces, size perception is about relations, directions, and proportions being presented perceptually. It needn't be about mind-independent sizes and distances, as organism relative as those might be. If they're mind-independent, that has to do with physical relations between organism and environment. Though these can be ascertained, these mind-independent relations from the layout, through known operations of measurement or estimation. So this way of looking at perceived surface layouts is at home in a conception of perception as having the function of representing or presenting relevant features of the environment. And I take presenting to be a kind of representing just when the presenting has a subjectively conditioned element. If you're presenting the world just as it is, then there's no representation because there, or there needn't be any representation if you can try to make the world itself the content uh, but once it's that we perceive the world under an aspect, then we are representing um, the physical world. That it does so under an aspect, that if perception presents the physical world under an aspect might be beneficial. The idea of presenting the environment in useful ways for, uh, also allows for normative evaluation. If for whatever reason a perceptual experience distorts the constant objects around relation, or fails to uh, present visual direction uh, adequately, these would be misperceptions of the sort that Gibson viewed as deficiencies of perception in the chapter on illusions. We may then note the following four features attributed to visual experience under the view that such experience uh, uh, represents or presents the environment under an aspect. A, its representational character is assigned as part of a task analysis or functional decomposition of vision as a system for environmental contacts. The one thing it does is it gets us in contact with the placement of things in the environment, uh, but within a subjectively contracted visual space. B, um, visual experience is normatively evaluable as vertical or not. C, it presents the environment under an aspect that is subject dependent. In vision, this aspect is an analog depiction. And D, such presentations are not sense data, and they are not the objects of perception. They are the means by which the environment that they present are perceived, so that what it is to see the floor is to see it in this subjectively conditioned way, but we're not seeing something else besides the floor when we do that. And the experience is just that, is just the thing that um, is the seeing of the floor. Gibson would not accept A as stated, but would change it to say that systems for, for, are for providing direct awareness of the physical environment uh, and that those are subject to a task analysis. I think his task analysis mistakenly retained physical leanings, as I've said. He would accept B, but reject C and D, suggesting that there is adequate information for perception of the objective physical environment and that that is what vision does. I think he's caught out here by the phenomenal fact that things do appear smaller in the distance.
All right, so now we're going on to problem two, non-cognitive uh, constructive processes. Gibson opposed the idea of construction in perception because for him it meant the traditional picture of using cognitive assumptions or learned rules to translate sensations into perceptions. Again, he held that the motivation for such operations came from a lack of a appreciation of the information available in the optic ray. But if adequate as information is there, he, he reasoned, no construction is needed. So let's continue to read his claims about adequate information. It seems as if there is still a need for some mechanism or process to convert stimulus information into perception of the visual world. The information available to the visual system doesn't copy the world. Rather, it specifies it in relation to a system that is attuned to or resonates with the available information. So an example will help. Gibsonians have successfully analyzed optic flow patterns that produce perception of motion observer through an environment. A flow pattern in the optic ray is outward radial expansion, uh, and that specifies forward uh, motion of the observer, especially if the radial expansion is of the whole is of the whole field of vision. There is, however, an obvious difference between the expansion within the optic array, which can be presented in two dimensions and is sampled by the two-dimensional surface of the retina, and the experience of moving forward in depth, which is an experience in 3D. Gibson recognized this and offered a division of labor to handle it. As a psychologist, he was working at the level of perceptual systems in the analysis of stimulus variables. If he could find a psychophysical relation between optical expansion and perception of observer forward motion, he then said that the perceptual system detects the information that specifies the motion. If pressed on how it does it, he allowed that receptors respond to light energies, but it was not his job to say how the receptors and visual nervous system integrate the patterns of stimulation um, that then gives, gives rise to the perception. Rather, he assumed that if he could show that complex stimulus information was psychophysically related to effective perception, then he could assume that the system does resonate to the information or that mosaics of receptor cells register stimulus patterns in the right way, and he, as the psychologist, could just move on. Nonetheless, Gibson allowed that it, it is a legitimate question to consider how receptor systems respond to and integrate the information contained in the optic flow. And you can see these allowances both in the 66 and 69 book. It is a problem for neuroscience, actually also in the 50 book, but who cares. It is a problem for neuroscience, not for psychology. And neuroscientists responded to the call by considering how a Gibsonian sensory system might be analyzed in neural mechanisms. An early effort in this was by um, a fellow named W.A. Vandegrint uh, in the Department of Comparative Physiology at Utrecht. So Vandegrint started from the notion of a smart mechanism, as suggested by Runison. And probably many people are familiar with this. A smart mechanism accomplishes a task by its mechanical structure rather than by having internal symbols and explicitly represented formulae. Runison's example was the planimeter a device for measuring the area of a closed figure. If one arm of the device is anchored and another is used to trace the boundary of the figure completely, one revolution, then the device provides a readout of the area of the figure. At no point does it consult explicitly represented formulae or for computing the area. There is no internal symbol system, hence the reasoning goes, no representations. Van de Grint sought to get inside special purpose smart mechanisms, such as those that guide a fish's swimming or that detect optical flow in an animal's perception of self-motion. He developed the neural side of smart mechanisms in, in what he took to be a contribution to Gibsonian direct theory, which he contrasted with inferential or mediated accounts. Van de Grint started by conceding that computers can be programmed to act like smart mechanisms to undertake the special purpose information detection. But computers differ from biological implementation of smart mechanisms in that at bottom their operations are carried out in a symbol system defined in relation to a CPU, and he's just taking a standard uh, understanding of a computer for that. He then compares the direct account of the guided action of swimming to a mediated or symbolically implemented uh, model. 
I'm going to bother to go ahead and, and actually read this out. He says, if one studies sensorily guided bodily actions, as most adherents of the direct perception theory do, it is sensible to attempt to circumvent postulates about internal representations, mediations, etc. The information relevant to the sensorily guided bodily actions resides in the environment, the body form, the interface between body and environment, and the smart mechanisms tuned to the peculiarities of the situation. No independent symbolic conventional representation is needed to replace the real things because the latter are always there and ready to go uh, when needed. So this is sort of like Rodney Book's robots before the day. Here we have a common move. Representational accounts as represented are as symbolic good old-fashioned AI models in which the perceiver is supposed to carry an internal model of the environment as opposed to be in being a tuned to the environment itself and operating on the background engineering assumption that ecological regularities hold within the environment. On this account, um, the bad account he's arguing against, representations replace real things rather than presenting those things. But the argument goes there is no need to posit explicit representations of body and environment um, that are consulted. He goes on. It is more sensible in this case to use the metaphor tuning to the environment than to speak of computations based on sense data. The swimming programs are smart special purpose systems that need no internal model of the body, the environment, and the hydrodynamic processes. They are an integral part of the whole system as it has evolved in millions of years and need no representation of the other parts of the system, only the appropriate feedback feed forward signal. The intelligence is distributed, not stored in neurons. At the same time, Van de Grint recognized the temptation to treat organismic processes that implement smart mechanisms as carrying out computations or implementing algorithms that account for distributed intelligence of guided swimming. But he disparages such talk as far-fetched. So this is the last of these long quotations. It seems rather far-fetched to call such natural processes mediated or computational or to call the swimming programs in the brain algorithms. If one chooses to do so, it is hard to see why an old-fashioned balance or a windmill should not be called an algorithm, or why the bending of a tree in the wind should not be called a computation. In my opinion, natural law-governed processes should not be called computational or algorithmic." End quote. Now, of course, the operations of a CPU are also natural law-governed processes. But he would, I think, argue that because standard digital computers are designed and the treating of their outputs as representations rests on convention, they can be separated from natural organic processes. This is, in effect, um, an appeal to the old distinction between rule following and rule described that was uh, discussed around this time, where rule following processes consult explicit symbolic encodings of rules and rule-described processes are so described merely because they're in accordance with laws of nature. Van de Grint seems to undermine the temptation to treat natural systems as embodying representations and computations by offering three examples as reductios, the balance, the windmill, and the bending of tree branches. On a teleofunctional func conception of representation that guides my inquiry here, we can rule out branches bending in the wind because we won't ascribe a function to compute or to represent to this natural system, to these branches. The bending follows natural laws that describe it, but it isn't the result of internal information processing in a teleofunctional sense. By contrast, the windmill is an artifact designed to carry out an intended function. But its teleofunction, Van de Grin might agree, is not to compute, but to provide power for grinding wheat or cutting logs. Finally, the balance may interpreted, be interpreted as a teleofunctional system that computes weights, including adding weights together as they're placed on one pan to even out the 2B weight item on the other pan. Analog computers, one might uh, assert, are also computers, even if they don't have internal symbols. Such systems are rule-described, as are all the systems in question. They are not rule-governed, that is, explicitly consulting rule-following uh, systems. Still, they are normatively valuable when described functionally, a balance can be broken. We call such teleofunctional described processes, or we can call them um, rule instantiated.
So it's got the normativity, it's got the rules, doesn't have the symbols, um, it's got the representations. Indeed, Ben Friend continued to feel the pull of describing natural systems as computing, which he did in a subsequent example. Although since it was not symbolic computing, he added scare quotes, so he said they compute. He further, his further example was of modular smart mechanisms, which he found to be functionally decomposable within module. Internal structures explain how the module works, and also um, to be functionally coordinated, smart modules can cooperate. His main example was a system for detecting optical flow patterns. A neural model of such a system might include as subcomponents local retinal motion detectors, or what Van de Gren called bilocal velocity detectors. So this is a bilocal velocity detector. So these are the familiar mechanisms shown here in the figure. These units have subcomponents, including orientation-sensitive edge detectors, coincidence detecting cells, functionally relevant response latencies. In the model, these velocity detectors, quotes, encode velocity information on what Van de Gren calls the labeled line principle. Activation of the line of a detector tuned to one of these velocities sends on to a subsequent detector mechanism the information or content that the velocity has occurred. Various mechanisms might make use of these subcomponents. Thus, a ring of such detectors uh, might detect outward optic flow, expansion from a center optic flow, by being sensitive to simultaneous activation of a bank of such detectors with orientation sensitivities aligned to perpendicular to the radii uh, uh, from a common center of expansion. A mechanism tuned to optical expansion, um, if it were tuned to just a local part of the visual field, um, might then feed other mechanisms, including looming detectors for fast approaching objects in at first a small area of the visual field, or self-motion detectors for detecting the motion of the observer, the self-forward motion of the observer, when the whole field flows. Van de Gren, of course, we can see the, see the kind of, that's a looming detector there, which is sensitive to um, outward flow in a small portion of the field of vision. Van de Gren, of course, considers these detectives, detectors to be non-computational and non-representational because they aren't instantiated in a symbol system. Like Gibson, he offers a binary choice, symbolic representations or no representations. Finding a CPU-driven symbol system to be neurally implausible, he goes for no representations and computations. Still, he uses teleofunctional language in describing the system, and presumably he would allow that they can be broken or dysfunctional. He also uses the representation-friendly language of encoding for his velocity detectors. Indeed, it seems quite natural to regard the velocity detectors as providing to the higher mechanism a representation of local retinal velocity. These higher mechanisms, depending on their functional descriptions, then have the function to represent a fast-approaching object uh, a looming object, or the forward motion of the perceiver. But the subunits that feed these higher units are not themselves detecting the environmental layout. Rather, they are tuned to features of proximal stimulation that then enter into further processes to yield a perception of environmental happenings, including the perceiver's body as part of the environment. It is reasonable to apply the language of representation and computation in these cases because there's information or content about stimulus patterns that is combined according to rules that are neurally implemented to produce perceptions of the environment. This is an instance of rule instantiation since the rules are sanctioned by a task analysis and are neurally instantiated but, but without a symbolic medium. Instead, Gibson's psychophysical level in which there is a one-to-one -one Instead of Gibson's psychophysical level, in which there is a one-to-one -one matchup between information in the optic array, say local optical expansion and a perception looming, we have here three things, optical information, encoding of aspects of this information that are realized in proximal patterns, and integration of representations of these patterns to yield a representation of the looming thing. At the neural level, we cannot simply treat the optical information as detected as if there is no structure within the detector mechanism. Rather, the early detectors respond not to the Gibson higher order invariant as specifying looming, but to optical patterns using local edges and timed coincidences 
yielding the encoding of bilocal velocity and organized uh, pattern. This description is, functional, is functionally that of representing proximal patterns so that they can enter into further processes that yield organism level perceptions. Given what must go into producing such perceptions, and given the difference between optic flow and the perception of forward motion, one might well regard the latter as a construction based on the former. The teleo function aspect of rule instantiation also supports ascriptions of incorrect encoding of velocity, including the improper looming perceptions or inaccurate perceptions of perceiver motion. The question of whether the information in the optic ray fully specifies looming becomes moot. What we need to know is whether the information is sufficient for the various detectors to respond accurately in cases of looming or forward motion. The ambiguity or lack of ambiguity of stimulus information must be judged in relation to detector mechanisms that respond to the optic ray and produce a perception. So we can summarize the difference between a functionally rule instantiating perceptual system such as I've described and Van de Grint's conception of a traditional symbol-based system. So in the symbol-based system, we have these computations. A description of the perceptual function to be explained, detection of a fast approaching thing or observer motion, analysis of the rules for combining the represented information, syntactically characterized internal system replete with an internal reader that responds to symbols with their syntax, expression of the symbol system, um, of an, in the symbol system of an algorithm for combining information and neural implementation of the symbol system, including the reader and the symbols. By contrast, um, a rule instantiating account of the information can get by with one and two being the same, three, and three to five are rejected and replaced with three prime, specification of the neural elements available to be combined so to carry out receptor detection of local information and the combination of that rep represented information, description of the neural mechanisms that operate on represented information to yield the perceptual outcome. Indeed, in other work, Van de Grin glosses encoding with representation, where the import of the latter word is not that he now embraces symbols, rather he uses the term to indicate of local content that neural mechanisms respond to, accepting that their content describes the stimulus aspect to which they are attuned, when regarded from a teleologic, teleofunctional perspective. So I've sought to overcome binary dichotomies often on offer, for example, between symbolic representations and no representations. More specifically, I've argued that an ecologically oriented, Gibson appreciating theorist can accept notions of organism level representation as subjectively conditioned phenomenal presentation and of subsystem encoding of representation of local information as part of a functional analysis of how information-rich stimulation is responded to and processed. Many Gibsonian sympathizers, but not all, refuse to go along with my reasoning. So far, I can't understand why, <laughs> but maybe you guys are going to help.